Welcome to church, whether you are joining us here in person or joining us online, we are thrilled to be here worshiping our great God together with you. Now will you receive this word from Psalm 100? Cry out to the Lord, cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. For the Lord is a gracious God whose mercy is everlasting and whose faithfulness endures to all generations. Friends, let's praise the Lord.
seated. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask you to mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness, in your great compassion. Cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of our salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit in the name of Jesus, our King, we pray. Amen. Well, friends, hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the peace of the world, for the unity of the church, and for the well-being of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the baptized, those who serve in the church, for our leaders, our teachers and pastors, for those who worship together with us around the world, for those who love God and those who the Lord is still working to reveal Himself to, let us pray. Lord, have mercy. For the president, for the leaders of the nations, for those in authority who are working to lead us through these trying times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our city, we pray for our city as we mourn the death and violence we've seen in these last days and weeks and months. We mourn recent shootings in Colorado, Indiana, California, Nebraska, Chicago, Atlanta, Minnesota, and more. We mourn the violence in our nation and around the world, in Myanmar, Venezuela, Yemen, Libya, Ukraine, and elsewhere. And so now for our city, for every city and community, for all those who live in them, for the people of the world who our God loves dearly, for those near us in our community who mourn, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the good worth which the Lord has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphaned, For the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the poor and oppressed, for those unemployed and destitute, for prisoners and captives, for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord, alleluia. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord, have mercy. And now, as we reflect on the pain, hardship, illness, violence, and injustice near and far, let us pause and lift our petitions to God in silence. And now we pray together as your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are Jason and Kristen Stuck, and we have four children. We have been coming to Christ Church for about 11 years now. We were blessed to be introduced to Christ Church through um, ministries during the week and have been involved in MAPS, Men's Bible Study Fellowship, and The Well. We have expanded into teaching Sunday school and men's fraternity, as well as serving as elder. And our faith has just been a huge part of our life and has been fed through Christ Church as we have continued to learn and grow through the teaching, been able to exercise our own giftings at the church and just really encounter Jesus in fresh and new ways. And also the opportunity to serve locally and around the world. First, remember tithing when uh, I was very young. I remember collecting my allowance, uh, doing my chores and receiving money. And I can't remember which of my parents, maybe both, sat me down and talked to me about what tithing was. I can't remember the exact amount I made, but I remember bringing a couple of quarters to church and placing them in the offering, uh, either during church or during Sunday school. And that just being implanted in me at a young age, that this is God's money and we have the opportunity to steward it, um, to use it for good things. Even as a young guy, I remember, I think I was five or six, and just remembering missionaries come and speak, uh, talking about the work they were doing, and feeling honored that I got to be part of that. And as I grew older, when I finally had a paycheck that was taxed, my dad sat down and encouraged me to tithe off of 
the gross number, not the after-tax number. And I remember thinking, that is crazy, who does that? <laughs> and then realizing that that's what my parents were doing. It's important for us to share our journey with our children, and we so desire for their hearts to lean into the Lord and want to be generous also. So just trying to meet each of our children where they're at and be patient, because again, we're on that journey. We want them to understand it's a journey for them too. I was in an elder meeting and we were introduced to Philanthrocore. The ability they had to sit down with us and go over our finances, have a vision for the future with our finances, and consider how giving plays a role in our finances. We were just so blessed by the wonderful person who helped us, who had patience in walking through the things we still had to learn. He was able to help us make decisions about the decades to come. And it really gave us a huge peace of mind of knowing, okay, what steps do we need to take to be secure financially, to be prepared, and legally, what other steps do we need to kind of tie up with our state and trusts and just preparation for our children. As we pass on, what do we want our legacy to be and how do we want to do that through our financial giving? For those that are concerned that they might not have money to give or that this isn't for them, I would say you're missing out on an opportunity to be part of what God's doing. He's going to do it anyway. You might as well jump in and be part of it. And we serve such a big God. Yeah. And it's cool to see how He uses money to even teach us that too. Well, friends, I, I've had the privilege of serving alongside the Stucks for many years now, and I can tell you that, 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 that they're the real deal. Um, something that I love about what Jason just said is that, that God invites us to, to partner with Him, to be a part of what He is doing in the world. And so I want to encourage our community as you give, however you give, as you give to the church of God, that you are working with God. You are partnering with Him to do His work in and around the world. Something that, that was a helpful tool for, for Jason and Kristen as they wrapped their minds around their own stewardship. How do they steward the resources that God has blessed them with so that they, they can use those and, and turn those back out into the world? Um, they mentioned an organization called Philanthrocorp. Um, if you'd be interested in learning more about Philanthrocorp and the work that they do um, to help uh, us grapple with, come to terms with, understand um, how do we use our resources well, um, please follow the information, the prompts on the screen, they would love to connect with you and to help you um, wrap your mind around your finances. Finally, friends, if you are new today, if you are joining us for the first time, maybe you got connected to Christ Church through our Easter services, maybe you've been with us for a while and really haven't um, found a way to, to get really plugged in into, into a more intentional, smaller community, we would love to help you do that. We have staff members and volunteers here at the church who would love to connect with you and help you get plugged into the life of the church. Maybe that's a small group, maybe that's serving with our children, whatever that looks like for you, we want to help you get plugged in. So if you are interested in taking that next step and really um, becoming a part of, of a, a tight community here at Christ Church, follow the instructions on the screen. We would love to connect with you. I'll be in the narthex after the service. You can find me too, and I would love to help you get plugged in. We hope you'll join us next week as we uh, launch a new series called Credo. As we look at, we, we walk methodically through the Apostles' Creed. In uncertain times where, where, where it can be hard to know what's true, what's right, there is real wisdom and value in our returning to the bedrock of our faith and returning to the ancient declaration of faith that is the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed has been a core document for the church for thousands of years. And so we are going to jump into the Apostles' Creed and explore what, what is it that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, believe. We hope that you will join us as we step into that starting next week. And now, friends, let us do as the Stucks modeled for us. Let's continue in worship by giving to God His tithes and our offerings, trusting that God will magnify our small gifts and He will use them for His kingdom purposes. Let's give back to God.
Lovely. Wasn't that amazing? Thank you, Marianne and David. So enjoyable. If that doesn't relax you, I don't know what does. Again, I want to welcome you. My name is Eric Haskins. I have the joy and the honor of being one of the pastors here at Christ Church. And I have the privilege of preaching this morning in this two-part series. And one of the things I want to do right at the beginning here is invite you to find the three other parts. It's a two-week series with four parts. Last week, Pastor Pete and Sue Ann Campfield preached. This week, myself and, and Reverend Tracy Bianchi and the Contemporary is speaking. So I encourage you, sometime over the next week or two, dig out those services from our media drop-down and our website and listen to them. In fact, we have a, a specially designed study guide just for that. And what you're going to get is you're going to gain a glimpse of post-resurrection stories throughout the scriptures. A lot of times they think we blow by the resurrection, we blow by Easter and say that was great, it was amazing, and then we go on with our life. But what we decided to do this year is just to pause and to really unpack these post-resurrection stories. And there's just too many of them to fit in, in, into these weeks, and so we chose four especially. I hope you will do that. So a question for you. Have you ever felt as if you had no idea as to what God was doing in your life? Or how about this, because that might seem a little scary or profane to think of uh, on a Sunday morning, either watching church or sitting in church. Have you ever questioned the circumstances in life to where you found yourself just wondering out loud or maybe under your breath, God, really? God, I, I just don't understand why you would allow this to happen. Are you sure this is a good idea for me? It's okay to admit this because I am sure and I am positive that you are in good company and you are not the only one either sitting right here or listening online who has, have had these same feelings and these questions to God. One of the most memorable times in my own life along this line was the summer of my 20th anniversary. The year previously, I just transitioned from a church where I was a senior pastor of for eight years. And why did we leave? Well, don't worry, nothing scandalous. At that time, we just knew God was leading us to something different. And we had a choice to make, whether to stay in the boat and be safe or to step out of the boat in the storm, in the chaos, in the questions with Jesus. And we knew at that time that God was leading us to make that choice. So we did the best to follow. And sure, so sure we heard this correctly, stepped out of the boat, so to speak, and left our church family. Now I knew it might take a couple months to find a new position somewhere with my gifts and passions that I had. But as I collected rejection letter after rejection letter, over the next year I began to wonder did we really hear God correctly? And I know I may not be the sharpest crayon in the box, but I know I'm not the dullest either. So fast forward a year to the summer of my 20th anniversary. We are out of money as we had been living off the sale of our house the last year. I have no job, and I find myself moving in with my in-laws. Not the way I had thought the summer of my 20th anniversary was going to go. But what I didn't know is even in the midst of the doubts and the questions, God had a different picture in play, and I just couldn't see it yet. Soon after moving in, Lynn and I noticed something wasn't quite, quite right with my father-in-law. And weeks later, we had the confirmation from the doctors that he was in a very fast decline with Alzheimer's. But notice where we were. We were in, literally in, living in the house physically with the family to give support, to give encouragement, to cry together, to laugh together over the, the next year and a half as my father-in-law passed that quickly. And I know Linda nor I regret the year of hard grace because it was hard, but it was grace-filled by God. And we were better for being there. Lynn and I have this working metaphor with God that we've experienced over the course of our years together. 
And, and the metaphor goes, we have a picture that we like, and it's really a picture that we create in our heart and mind and soul. And we go, we like that picture. We're going to step out in faith following that picture. And then God goes in his gentle way, oh, that's so cute of you guys. Because by the way, Haskins, that picture you so are stepping out in faith with, um, it's a panoramic. In fact, that picture is too small for what I intend to do in your lives, for what I'm intending to do. In fact, you have that picture framed all wrong. And now let me show you what the true picture is that I am doing in you and with you. Any of you experienced something like this? Where your expectations didn't meet reality and you began to question God's plan. You began to question God's goodness, even God's faithfulness, dare I say. Maybe you're in the midst of that right now. And again, you are, you are not alone. In fact, not only am I sure there's others around you experiencing same such questions, but they're also all over the emotional spectrum. Everywhere from downright angry towards God to a deep sadness and disappointment over the circumstances of their life right now and on the road they find themselves on. Now, I don't have specific answers for you here this morning, but what I do offer is the acknowledgement and the belief that Jesus is on the road with you. You might not be able to see or feel Christ's presence right now, but know this, Jesus is on the road with you in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your questions, in the midst of your unbelief, in the midst of your tensions. The interesting thing is that the scriptures are full of these types of situations. This morning we're going to join two others who are on the same road with us. Two others who are questioning God and have had such high expectations. Two others who were so sure of the story that they had pictured and had framed in their hearts and minds through the years. And two others who saw that picture just crumble before them thinking they have lost all hope to others who thought everything was at the end, or so they thought. Listen now to the story of these two others as they walk the road. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened, As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. Jesus asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, His body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, 
Stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they recognized him when he was breaking the bread. This, this is, is the word, word of the Lord. Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, choir. So the story opens, and we find ourselves with our two new friends on a road covered in sadness and confusion. And then something very unexpected happens. The risen Christ joins them. And that's not the unexpected thing. It might be unexpected, but there's more. The unexpected thing is that they don't recognize him. In fact, we're told that God prevented them from recognizing Jesus in their midst. Now that's a formational point. And formational point, I like, I like to use that term a lot. Formational points are those ideas, practices, uh, uh, key learnings, gleanings from the scriptures that when infused with the grace of God, transform us. They transform our understanding of how God works. They transform our view of ourself and they transform our view of each other. And we're going to be looking at many different transformational points today. So here's a transformational, formational point. Why would God keep these two bewildered, saddened followers of Jesus recognizing the risen Christ in the midst? Why would he do that? Draw this formational point to yourself. Why would God keep you from recognizing and experiencing Christ's presence when you believe you need it the most? It makes me think of the classic Christian work, The Dark Night of the Soul, by St. John of the Cross. In essence, a simple summary is when God seems the most distant from us, when God seems the most distant, the most absent, when we cannot see him on the road, that is when the God is doing his deepest work in us. Stay the course. Stay on the road. Dawn is coming. Fits well with our encouragement this morning to have us realize you may not see Jesus, but Jesus is there with you on the road. It's for this, these reasons when I experience these types of points in my life, I do my best, not perfectly, but I do my best to move from asking, but God, why? I do my best to move towards asking Jesus, towards what end? Jesus, towards what end? Why God? Towards what end is this happening? What's the end game here, Jesus? In having me experience X, because I got to admit, X was bad. It nearly done me in, but Y and Z right now, Jesus, that just seems cruel if I'm honest. So Lord, I, I'm doing my best. To what end is this happening? And no, no, I don't always have an immediate answer. In fact, sometimes it's weeks, it's years even, and sometimes even then I have just a glimpse of understanding but I do know a movement in my heart and mind from why to what end engages me to actively seek God versus distancing myself from God. Moves me towards God versus away. And towards God is always the direction I want to be in in my life. And with our friends here on the road, I do have a guess as to what God wanted to have happen in their midst when they were blinded to the presence of of Christ, and which is actually another formational point with us. So let's rejoin them. If you have your Bibles open, verse 17. You seem to be in a deep discussion about something Jesus said. 
What are you so concerned about? They stop short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in all Jerusalem who hasn't heard about these things that have happened the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. Okay, so now just realize this, folks. Anytime Jesus asks a question in the scriptures, that is a formational point at hand. Anytime Jesus asks, Jesus asks a question in the scriptures, that is a formational point at hand. It's reminiscent all the way back to the garden in Genesis. God looking for Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? You can be sure that question by God wasn't for God's benefit. Oh no, I knew I should have made it just guarded so jungly. I lost my creation. No. It was a formational point for Adam and Eve to realize where they were. They were in hiding, in shame, covered up, and they separated themselves from God, from themselves, and from each other. So Jesus here joins the two disciples on the road in the midst of the questions and doubts and fears and misunderstands them and asks them a question for their benefit, not for his. So what things? He wanted them to process. He wanted them to be with them as they processed. Jesus didn't come in saying glib statements. Oh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure things are going to work out okay. Wink, wink. He doesn't do that. He joins them in their, their tension silently at first. And he walks with them. And then he engages with them, asking them questions to get that out in front of them. So for them to hear their own concerns, their own fears, their own doubts, their own perspective and picture of the situation at hand. Think about it. Why is meeting with a therapist so helpful? It's because it gets your, your tensions of your life out in front of you to see them, to gain a different perspective, to process them, and process them in a healthy way. It's one of the reasons I meet with a spiritual director every month. And those of you who aren't familiar with spiritual directing, my spiritual director doesn't tell me what to do. A spiritual director, a good spiritual director, simply through prayer-filled questions directs me to the activity of God's work in my life. And I can guarantee there hasn't been a month that goes by that I'm with my spiritual director that he doesn't help me connect the dots. And even though I couldn't see Jesus on the road with me over the course of this last month between these two different things, he was there. And through wise questions, am I, I'm able to process and see how those two are related and what God was doing. And Jesus does this here through asking what things. So they start processing and in essence say, we had thought Jesus was the real deal. We had thought Jesus was the gift and answer to our prayers. We had thought we had finally, we are finally going to be able to throw Rome off as Jesus comes in victorious for us. But then something happened that is shaking our faith to the core that has had us question everything, even the goodness of our religious leaders. We don't know about them anymore. And not only that, but we're questioning God's care, God's protection, God's promises to us. We don't know what to do because this Jesus that all our hopes were on, that we pictured was going to solve everything, he was crucified. How do you not know this? And not only was Jesus crucified, but some women who were also his close followers went to his tomb this morning. They said he's arisen according to an angel they met. I know it sounds crazy. I don't know how it's possible. We have so many questions. None of this makes sense. It's definitely not what we had pictured. So in the place of raw, bubbling emotion and confusion, Jesus joins the two friends processing their face faith along this road. You, you see the formational point there? Sharing with others our pain, our doubts, our fears is essential for our spiritual formation. It is why we so are behind small groups in our church. 
and getting connected in community in some fashion. And whether it's that's with 12 people in your living room, whether that's with a mid-sized community where you are truly known and you're able to know others, or whether it's with two or three over coffee every week, that you're trying to point each other to Jesus. It is needed. It is so needed in our growth and development. And don't miss, don't miss how Jesus is using this space, using their blindness in his, to his presence to help them, to help them vocalize, to help them get in front of them, their issues, their questions, their fears. And as we listen with Jesus, see if you can pick up and are familiar with or identify with any of these same questions, doubts, or practices. We, we sense and hear the shattered expectations of what they thought God was supposed to do and be in their lives. They had a plan and God, God didn't follow it. How dare he? Jesus, the promised one of God, came to earth to die. It just doesn't fit with what they thought would happen. With how they had already planned and pictured for God to act on their behalf. The people they had trusted in, good religious types, the religious leaders, uh, maybe are not so good. They turned against them. They let them down. And perhaps they're not so loving or in tune with God as they thought. Think of the evangelical giants we know in our own real life from the last five years who have fallen and have left churches disillusioned and people scattered and wrecked havoc in the church. May I paraphrase Paul's encouragement to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11. Follow your leader's example only as they follow Jesus. Follow your leader's example. Follow the pastors of Christ's church only as we follow the example of Jesus. Let that ring in our ears and hearts. They focused on proof texting certain scriptures at the cost of delivering half-truths of the scriptures. They were looking for a Messiah who was a conquering king, not one who was a suffering servant. Now granted, to some degree, we all do this, don't we? We all have our favorite passages to prove our point. All you got to do is turn here and clear as day. And it's always a sign of humility and maturity to keep in front of us another reminder from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 13, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. I do not have the whole picture. This is my best understanding, but I admit, I'm not God. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. And it's here at this point, thanks to the prodding of Jesus, that their questions are out before them in the midst of them kind of squinting through the fog, so to speak, with their hearts breaking and their questions nagging. Jesus gives them now a different perspective. He points them to the truth and helps them to see the full picture of what God is up to. Then Jesus said to them, verse 25, you are such, and now when, I, when I read this, hear this as, I don't think Jesus is pointing the finger, yelling, stamping his fist. I think it's a little bit under the breath going people in general, the teaching of the culture in general. He's just like, so like almost a frustration. Ah, oh, you foolish people, come on. You find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted by the prophets that the Messiah would have to suffer? You had one picture. You were proof texting. There's another picture there. You have to combine the two. That the Messiah would have to suffer all these things. Then Jesus quoted passages from the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining what all the scriptures said about himself. This emphasis, this formational point, I always like to remind myself of here at the beginning is that written scripture leads us, the written word leads us to the living word. 
The written word is never an end in itself. It's always an avenue to experience the risen Christ. Now what Jesus does here is pretty profound. And if you're like me, you missed it the dozens and dozens of times you've read this passage and just blown by it. In brief, in brief, the Old Testament, just, just stay with me here, the Old Testament, as they knew it, as Jewish people knew it at this time, was divided up into three parts. It was the law, the writings of Moses, part one. It, it, it was the prophets, and it was the rest of the scriptures, the writings as they were called. The three parts, and those three parts could, together were called the Tanakh. The Tanakh is an acronym of the first letter in Hebrew of each of those three parts, the Tanakh. Now what Jesus does here, notice verse 27. Jesus is doing more than saying, hey guys, you misread these passages. Here's some of my favorite verses. Notice what Jesus does. He begins to quote, number one, the writings of Moses. Number two, from the prophets. And number three, from the writings in the scriptures. So Jesus in essence is saying, the Tanakh, the scriptures as you know it, all three parts. In fact, let me show you how all three parts together, all the totality of the scriptures, do what? Point to me. I am the picture that you're missing. The full picture, the crucified, resurrected Jesus. The story continues. And in Jesus saying this, he's saying the story continues with a thrilling new chapter. It was there all the time, but they couldn't see it because they had their own picture blinding them to what was truly there. I love N.T. Wright's summary of this. The resurrection isn't just a surprise, happy ending for one person. It is instead the trunk point for everything else. It is the post of which all the old promises come true at last. The promises of David's, David's unshakable kingdom. The promises of Israel's return from the greatest exile of them all. And behind that again, that all the nations will now be blessed through the seed of Abraham. We just continue, we just got out of a series looking at all the covenants. In essence, N.T. Wright is saying all the covenants of the Old Testament, they're all about Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment. And the story gets even better here. Verse 28. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of the journey. Jesus would have gone on, but they begged him to stay the night with them since it was getting late. So he went home with them. Now, I, I find this interesting. Jesus would have gone on. It's almost as if Jesus is giving them the option. Do you want more? Jesus kind of, you know, fake, faking that walk away. Do you want more? And he's, he's getting them skin in the game. He once got them to say all their fears and questions and doubts, and now he's getting them to say, yes, I want more. I want more of you, Jesus. You're wetting our appetites. Our hearts are starting to stir. And they most definitely do. Verse 30, as they sat down to eat, Jesus took a small loaf of bread, asking God's blessing on it, broke it, then gave it to them. Now, it's interesting to note that 70%, 70 of the parables of Luke involve some sort of food or meal that take place around. And not only are the parables, 70% of the parables, but let alone the narratives as we're reading here. There's something about sitting down at a table, talking about things of the faith, creating that space over a table, over a meal. There's something disarming. I've realized that in my own life anew the last couple months as I've been making a point to sit down across the table literally from people who do not look like me, who do not come from the neighborhoods I grew up in. But over the last several months, I've made it a point to sit down at the table with them, to listen and hear each other's stories, to see and, and point to where Jesus might be on each other's lives. And it's amazing, it's humbling what we're discovering about each other. It's amazing how often I say, well, Jesus can't be in their life because X, Y, and Z. 
And it's amazing how much I find listening to those people who don't look like me say the same thing about me, then all of a sudden we point to each other and like, whoa, wait a minute. That's exactly what God was doing in my life. This is a deeply biblical practice and is seen throughout the Gospels. Granted, in this season of COVID, it might be a little more difficult, but it still can be done. And I can see Jesus do this now with a small smirk on his face. Does this sound familiar to anyone? When and where do we see Jesus taking bread, blessing it, breaking it, and handing it out? Of course, it's the feeding of the 5,000. And remember that formational point? What was the point at the end of the 5,000? Receives the bread, receives the fish, gives thanks, breaks it, spreads it out. And then he has how many baskets left over for the disciples? Twelve, twelve baskets, twelve disciples. Do you think there's a connection? He was telling the disciples in that moment of the feeding of the 5,000, even though you're on the road with me and it seems impossible, the task before you, I will provide. I'm with you whether you see the out or not. And of course, just a few days before, he was in the upper room breaking bread as part of the Last Supper, which, you know, in hindsight, that was probably a really bad name for it. Because here Jesus is again celebrating across the table. Now, do we have a relationship? Do we have an experience with Jesus like this, because when he reaches out his hands, was it in reaching out his hands that they saw the nail imprints? We don't know, but there sure seems to be an echo of Isaiah 53, 5. And by his wounds, we are healed because suddenly when Jesus is reaching out, breaks the bread, reaches out and gives it to him, perhaps they glance and see the nail imprints in his hands, his wounds, suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. A relationship with Jesus is more than head knowledge. There is an experiential element with Jesus. Even when Jesus unfolds all the stories from the scriptures as they knew it, he tells them the facts about it. There's still no transformation of the heart. It's only when that is combined with the experience of Jesus himself there in their midst that a transformation happens. Jesus is the transforming element. We create space with each other, but Jesus is the one that transforms us. And they said to each other in verse 32, didn't our hearts feel strangely warm as he talked with us on the road and explains the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they went back to Jerusalem. Now remember, they go back to Jerusalem. That's seven miles away. They had just walked all the way there after an exhausting day at the cross that weekend and hearing these reports. And now they're going back in the middle of the night now, seven miles, to tell the story, cause and reaction. Obviously here, it's post-resurrection, and it is definitely a miraculous event, but I think there's a formational point for us to glean here as well. This doesn't end with a candlelight meal. Doesn't end with a nice Bible study. Oh, that was nice. Thanks for sharing with us, Jesus. They get up right then and go back to Jerusalem. And the question, the formational point I lay over my own life, is my experience with Jesus compelling enough to share my story? Is my intimacy with Jesus compelling enough for me to share that and have others experience? This is our call as followers of Jesus, this side of the resurrection. We are also witnesses of the resurrected Christ. We are now the sent ones. As we wrap up this formationally rich passage this morning, I want to pose to you two questions, two questions for you to talk with, to sit with, to talk with about with your spouse, spouse, with your family, over lunch, with God himself, to journal through. And each of these questions can apply no matter where you you find yourself in your spiritual journey this morning. First question is, how are you creating space to experience the living Jesus? How are you creating that space to experience the risen Jesus? If you say, I don't know, then it probably isn't happening well. Second question, 
And from that experience, what and whom do you need to share with? Sometimes that experience isn't all, you know, rainbows and butterflies, folks. Sometimes it's hard. God's going to hold that mirror up to your soul. But those are the formational points that are worth living for. Because in their points, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and now extends his grace and his love to us. And he's there in our midst on that road with us. These each apply no matter where you are on your spiritual journey or how you feel on your journey. Remember Jesus there. Voice your questions, your doubt, your fear. Share them with a trusted friend on the road. Then listen to where Jesus is pointing you in the scriptures. Not as an end in themselves, but as a means to engage with the risen Christ. Create that space to be with Jesus at the table of your life and look for him to appear. Because whatever you might think right now, know this. Jesus is on the road with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are and who you are in our lives. And Lord, we thank you that you truly are on the road with us. You promise never to leave us nor forsake us. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. or on live stream. For those of you who are in person, we do ask that you would wait to be dismissed by our ushers. And uh, in the meantime, receive this benediction. May you experience the burning of your hearts by the love and the grace of Christ in such a way that it will compel you to share the story. Go now. Be with Jesus, the risen one. Enjoy. Thank you.